Hey guys, welcome to your first U.S. Constitution Unit um, video. This is Chapter 3 in your textbook, and remember this is one of the two tests that you have to take and pass in order to graduate, so make sure you pay attention and take good notes. Our essential questions for this uh, video are why was the Constitution necessary, and what were the underlying principles of the plans proposed to draft the Constitution? So to begin with, the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Now remember, the Articles of Confederation was the first type of government that we had set up in the, in the United States. This was before our Constitution was drafted. Uh, we came up with this weak central government for our Confederation because we didn't want to end up with the same type of abusive, all-controlling, super-powerful monarch that we had in Great Britain. So there were many weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation, but the big three that I want you to remember are that they had no power to tax, they had no power to regulate trade, and they had no power to enforce laws upon the states. So if you need to pause me here and go back and record those in your notes, then please do. <clears throat> Moving on then to the Annapolis Convention. Uh, this convened in September of 1786. So this was a full year before, well, about uh, nine months before um, the Constitutional Convention convened. But the whole point of the Annapolis Convention was that we wanted to get together to discuss issues of interstate commerce. Okay, interstate commerce meaning commerce among the states. Uh, remember, one of the weaknesses from the articles was that the federal government had no power to regulate trade and therefore had no power to regulate interstate commerce. So um, a whole bunch of representatives from our colon or from our states at that time came together in Annapolis, Maryland for the purpose of discussing interstate commerce, something that they could fix, some things that they could um, make a little better uh, concerning that issue. Well, they got to talking instead of interstate commerce about maybe we ought to fix this form of government that we have. Maybe that's the underlying problem. So they agreed to meet again in May of 1787 in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> and their sole purpose of meeting at the Constitutional Convention, and this is something I want you to remember, was to amend the Articles of Confederation. Okay, their goal was not to go in and start a brand new government. Their goal was simply to amend the Articles of Confederation. So uh, the Constitutional Convention convened in May of 1787, and we were able to um, come up with a draft of the Constitution uh, that could be signed in September of 1787. So some plans and compromises. Uh, it's important to remember that when the Constitutional Convention uh, started, James Madison came in with a whole plan of what he thought our federal government should be. Like he had it down to the finest point. Um, but when he walked in and, and discussed those plans, everybody didn't jump on board right away. Okay, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of arguing, um, a lot of compromises that had to be made in order for our new government to take off. So the first thing, uh, the first plan was proposed by James Madison, and that was the Virginia plan. Now, the big issue that was discussed in the Constitutional Convention was over representation in Congress. So let's backtrack for a second. Representation in Congress. Congress is our legislative body. And right now, we have representation based on, represent, on population in the House of Representatives, but we have equal representation in the Senate. So remind me tomorrow in class and I'll discuss that a little more. So the Virginia plan proposed by James Madison. It called for a bicameral legislature and it called for representation based on population. Those are three things that you should know about the Virginia plan. It was proposed by James Madison. It was a bicameral legislature and it called for representation based on population. So bicameral legislature means two different houses and we'll come back to that in a second. The next plan that was proposed was the New Jersey plan, and this was proposed by William Patterson. And this called for a unicameral legislature, and it called for equal representation in, in Congress. So here's how I remember the differences between the Virginia and the New Jersey plan. <clears throat> if you were to look at Virginia on a map, from 1787, it would be a huge state. Virginia included not just what we know as Virginia today, but also West Virginia and a little bit of Kentucky. So it was a really big state. Um, if you were to look at a map of New Jersey in 1787, it would be a really small state. Okay, so representation based on population 
would have definitely benefited Virginia, which was a state that was large in land size, but also in population. Uh, equal representation in the legislature would have benefited a smaller state like New Jersey, smaller in land size and also smaller in population. So keep that in mind. The three things you should know for the New Jersey plan, it was proposed by William Patterson. It called for a unicameral legislature and it called for equal representation. So uh, what we come up with is the Connecticut Compromise. This is also called the Great Compromise. Um, and both of those terms will probably be used in your EOC. So the Connecticut Compromise um, took parts of both the Virginia and New Jersey plans. And here are the things you should know. It called for a bicameral legislature, which means two houses. It called for representation based on population in the House of Representatives. And it called for equal representation in the Senate based on population in the House of Representatives, and it called for equal representation in the United States Senate. Now, this is important to us. Why? Because this is what we ended up with today. So we have the House of Representatives in which representation is based on how many people live in a state, and then we have the Senate where representation is equal no matter what. So next, we have the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now, the Three-Fifths Compromise uh, dealt with slavery. OK, and this is something that you most likely talked about in American history way back in the day. Uh, but the three fifths compromise um, was made because our founding fathers realized that if they would have made an absolute decision on whether or not we were going to have slavery, you're going to alienate and possibly lose part of the country because the 13 states at that time. Uh, the southern states were heavily reliant on slavery. We know that uh, not just because of their, their cultural traditions, but also because of the economic situation. Uh, the north at that time, some northern states still allowed slavery. Um, so they, the founding fathers realized that if we would have said, yes, we're going to have slavery or no, we're not going to have slavery, then we would have possibly not ratified the Constitution. So they purposely came up with the three-fifths compromise um, which basically allowed us to kick that issue of slavery a little further down the road and let somebody else mess with it. And we did that during the Civil War. So the Three-Fifths Compromise, here's what happens. Uh, our founding fathers said that the southern states could count three-fifths of their slaves for representation and tax purposes. Now, it's important to remember that these slaves were not citizens. Uh, they were not told that they were counted and the other ones weren't. Uh, they were simply counted as numbers for representation um, and tax purposes. That's it. And we'll talk more about that in class if you have some questions. All right. And the last compromise that I want to talk about is the issue of um, the presidential term limit. No one really knew how long the president should serve. This And this is kind of weird for us to think about, but we were really the first country to come up with this concept of the president in a federal system. So um, it, it, we just didn't know what kind of precedent that we wanted to set. So some people said that the president should serve for life. Um, some people said that the president um, should only be able to serve for one year at a time, that every year we would have a new president. Can you imagine how chaotic that would have been? So uh, our founding fathers came up with the four-year term. Now, it's important to remember that in the original Constitution, there was no term limit. So the president could theoretically run and be elected as many times as they wanted. Uh, so the president was able to serve four year terms. So every four years, we would have a, a presidential election to potentially elect a new president. And we'll talk about the Electoral College and how that all works uh, in class. But if you guys have any questions, please don't forget to ask in class. Um, make sure that you complete your note taking activity um, along with this video. See you.